we use the word rehabilitation, like when a judge sentences someone to sentences someone to the Department of Corrections, they're sending them there for this rehabilitative process. And currently, the way it's it's, it's set up, there is no positive reinforcement for actually joining the programming. So us incentivizing the programming and giving resources and money to the space to incentivize the program, it is one of the ways that we are actually contributing to a safer Minnesota. And for the average incarcerated person, it will give meaning to their days. It will give meaning to the phone calls to their family. It will give meaning to the visits from their family because it's a different type of check-in. Hey, how was the programming going? So every time you create, you complete another program and your family knows you're taking a step closer to your own dreams and you're also taking a step closer to them. But most people who end up in prison end up in prison because they were, you know, anti the rules and following the rules. They feel like never got them nothing good. So if it was to incentivize the programs, even for the people who don't believe in the stuff, muscle memory. You go to the barbershop enough times, you're bound to get your hair cut. So if we get people on the track of, I do good, good things happen for me. I do good, good things happen for me. It would absolutely shift rehabilitation and people would be saying, hey, actually, so if I do good, good things happen for me. And that would turn rehabilitation. You know, I think the DOC does, does a pretty good job in terms of the breadth of possible, um, you know, there's lots of different programs, right? Unfortunately, lots of those programs have a very limited capacity because of funding and other things like that. And the more that we can expand some of those programs, the, the more that you know, the, the the more that we can reduce the wait times to get into those uh, into those programs, um, and th you know, the more people are going to be successful. So today, I'm speaking to you from the number one criminology program, you know, in in the country that consists the, the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice is consistently ranked as the number one criminology program in, in the country, if not amongst the top in the world. Um, and I'm here because I, um, you know, I, I, I finished my PhD at the University of Minnesota. But before that, I started my educational journey and in St. Cloud Prison. It was in St. Cloud when I first began taking college courses that eventually led me to go uh, after I was released, it led me to, um, uh, to community college where I finished there, transferred to the U, finished my undergrad, and then finished my PhD. But if it wasn't for the the, the opportunities, the, the the opportunity to take college courses while I was incarcerated, I never would be into the in the position where I am today. I have no idea where I would be otherwise, but I know that I wouldn't be here without that opportunity. And so. Uh, when I look at the possibility, the transformative possibilities of education, I have, obviously think back to my own experience, but I also think back to the experience of, of many of the other people I saw go through these programs and how, how the, the opportunities, um, you know, the, the chance to be in one of these classes really was like a light switch for many of them, um, realizing, you know what, there is another way, right? And, and I think that the more that we as a society, the more that the, you know, obviously the legislature can support these types of programs, the better off we're going to all be in terms of, you know, our communities and obviously the state of Minnesota. You know, a lot of times, um, you know, when when people are being reentered into the community, we're, um, we have to focus on those stability factors for these people. They might not have housing, food, clothing. And so our focus gets put on those things before it gets put on rehabilitation, before we can even work with somebody um, in, um, in promoting that change and um, um, increasing community safety. And so it's important to fund people that are starting fresh so that they're not getting into um, different mental health circumstances that can help happen, whether it's anxiety, depression, how am I gonna do this? I might as well just go back to my old ways um, because no one's gonna give me the opportunity anyway, so I'll just do what I know. Um, it's important to fund them because we spend so much money keeping them in and an appropriate fund can help people stay out and become productive, which is our model in Minnesota as it relates to rehabilitation. We work with the human population because they're human beings. I'm a firm believer and I work very strongly 
with uh, following the law and respecting the law and accountability for that. So in no way do I want this to be something that people get to do and act and behave how they choose and we need to fund that. Um, I don't think that that's the message we need to give, but we do need to say to those that have been in prison or are coming out or don't want to re-enter that we're willing to um, do something different because life happens to everybody. Because, you know, a lot of people that are getting out have lost a sense of um, identity, lost about, you know, lost values and um, things that have been taught to them just due to, you know, drug use, um, living in survival mode, and, you know, you forget to really um, work on that healing space that Indigenous people, you know, have within their own lives, you know, and so I think that um, it's just really important that we include that when we're transitioning people back into community. I think especially for Native American men, if they have a safe place to come home to that provides support, that provides them with culture, um, I don't see them failing. I see them exceeding. Um, I feel that I see them, you know, walking with confidence and believing in themselves. And I think that's really important because these are the men in our community. These are our fathers, our brothers, our uncles when they're coming home it's hard for them to even find a place to come home to because of the limited amount of housing um over the last year year and a half or so we've had to create wait lists for our clients we've had to close down locations or different groups that we're offering because we don't have the staff to provide the service not that we don't have the clients that need the service but we don't have the staff to provide the service Only an increase in funding would help us be able to treat more clients. Our wait lists could be reduced in size. We would be able to expand the breadth of services that we provide. Um, for example, um, many of the services that we are required to perform under a contract or for the courts or for probation are things that health insurance does not cover. And so, um, that increased funding is really needed to bridge the gap between what a client can afford to pay us for services, what their health insurance may cover, and then what we're actually being required to do as a sex offender treatment provider. Um, we work with a population that struggles to find supportive services, struggles to find stable housing where they would like to live, struggles to find work. Um, we are not able to coordinate case management for our clients because insurance doesn't reimburse for it. Uh, and we just don't have the funds. And we really need people with lived experience to help people find stable housing, help coordinate fair chance employment opportunities, do some leadership and education around that, and also just help with other supportive services. These people are our brothers, our neighbors, our, our friends. Um, we've demonized them, right? because they've done some terrible things, absolutely. Um, but we've demonized them and othered them in a way that really isn't accurate. They are just like us in so many ways. They have made terrible choices and they've caused a lot of harm, but they that doesn't have to define the rest of their life. We can help make the rest of their life look a lot differently and that's what we're here to do. I don't know how we can continue to to do what we're doing without any assistance because um, again, we, we can't do our jobs. What we are set to do to work with these clients and help rehabilitate them and get them the skills um, that they need to be successful when we're having to continuously focus on um stability factors I, I know funding is always a um a sore topic with with everybody everybody's you know fa always faces you know budget you know cuts mm -hmm. and you know wondering okay what is least important and, and what is most important though it is all important and i know how difficult it can be but these people are in our community um and we should do whatever we can to um help them start on a successful venture when they're released.